I think we're good. Get the better phone reception. My brain is moving yeah. uh, faster than my mouth is. On the timer. Slide this aside for a second. Uh, good afternoon. It is Whiskey Wednesday. Spirits Guide coming to you guys live. What you some wine spirits out here in West Boylston, unmasked amongst the people. Uh, which means, I guess, if anybody walks up, can the taste as well. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. All right. Sorry, sorry. We're, we're working on some, some technical stuff. We get some new equipment coming, so hopefully that, nice. that gets better. Um, yeah, before we dive into this, I want to talk about tomorrow. The first sort of official in store tasting we are doing. We are finally back. We are back. We're doing a blind tasting. Back here, back bar. Come in, see me. Um, I'm going to blind taste you Eagle Rare against Russell's Reserve, um, just to kind of prove that Russell's Reserve is as good, if not better, than Eagle Rare. And you know what? It's available. Uh, which also kind of reminds me that Eagle Rare is going to wrap back around when we talk about the Four Roses. Um, again, you got to reiterate about allocated Buffalo Trace stuff come in and you're asking for something, you go like, this is hard to find everywhere. Doesn't mean we have it either. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's hard to find everywhere. I'm not hiding it in the back room, I promise you. Whatever we have, if it's for sale, it is out on the shelf. There's no secret back room. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, yeah, nobody seems to have it. But call me. It, it, it yeah. just doesn't work that way. Um, we do get Eagle Rare from time to time. It's not incredibly rare. It's not like Weller or anything. Um, but this is available all the time. Both 10-year, both small batch, both 90 proof. Blind taste them, see for yourself. Um, and this is much less expensive. On sale for Father's Day this month. Uh, yeah, we're gonna wrap back around the Eagle. Just because there's some really interesting stuff. So yeah, Father's Day coming up this weekend. Um, that's where we're at. Because really, who says you can't give your dad roses for Father's Day? Four roses. Seriously. Um, we're just going to start and, and kind of taste as we talk through. Um, Four roses, yellow label bourbon. This is the flagship uh, 80 proof bourbon. When you say flagship, that's just like the. Yeah. It's generic or OG it, it's, kind of. Yeah, it's kind of what they're known for. Um, I guess Bud Light is the flagship of the Budweiser lineup, and then everything else is sort of an extension off of that. Yep. Um, this was the first sort of when uh, Four Roses goes back to being a bourbon. Um, this is a brand and a whiskey that has taken its lumps has seen the highest of highs, the lowest of the lows, and then back to the highest of highs. Yeah. Again, um, bourbon is all about stories, some of which are true. Uh, the origin story of this brand, uh, there was a family called Rose. There's a guy and his brother and two sons, they were the four Roses. Uh, there's one theory that they are actually the ones who created the brand. Um, <clears throat> but the current owners, these guys are actually owned by Kieran. Brewery. It's a Japanese brewery, um, and bourbon is huge in Japan, by the way. Uh, they're the number two selling bourbon in Japan, behind Jim Beam, which is the number one selling bourbon uh, in the world. At under 20 bucks, too, this is yeah. one of those great, great values. Sort of the story that Kieran goes with for their marketing um, is that this was kind of, it was a guy named Paul Jones who was the first one to copyright the name Four Roses, to register the brand Four Roses. Um, a relative of Jones, uh, Lawrence Jones, uh, had been courting this woman, Mary Peabody, for years, like five years, which sounds a little stalkerish to me. But, 
<laughs> Apparently he really, really liked her. Um, and there was a big dance going on, I believe, in Chicago. And uh, there's an old Victorian thing called the Code of, of Roses. It was a way of communicating. Yeah. Uh, one rose had a certain meaning, two roses had a certain meaning. And uh, he finally decided he was going to ask this woman to marry him one more time. He sent her a dozen roses with a card that said, uh, if the answer is yes, show up wearing a corsage of four roses. Yep. She walked into the dance. She's got the four roses on. Thus, the brand name was born. Um, later in the 1880s, Paul Jones actually, again, registers that name. Uh, the Jones family were rectifiers, which means they bought bourbon from other distilleries, and they would blend it. Um, they had a massive fortune. They were uh, really, really successful businessmen, so they were able to financially get access to some of the best bourbons, uh, and they created a really well-known brand name. <clears throat> they also became huge innovators in marketing. Um, a lot of the information that I get, by the way, is from this book, which was written by a guy named Al Young, who was the Four Roses GM. Um, and then he became the brand ambassador. Uh, he's one of the few names that are associated with uh, Four Roses that you can't really do without. You guys won't get to see this from video. I let Corey kind of thumb through it. He just kind of poke through. He shows a lot of the old advertising. Oh, wow. Yeah. You kind of get a sense of the kind of innovation that they have. That story wow. is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, this is a great book. If you're a Four Roses nut, if you've got a great home bar, uh, you're looking for a decorative piece, I think I bought this on Amazon. Wasn't that cheap? Written by Al Young. Um, but things like this, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's a block of ice that has Four Roses frozen into it that they actually had to create. It's a cake of ice. Yeah. Uh, they apparently tried to put the suspend the roses in the water and then freeze them. Yeah. And then when the water would freeze, it would crush them. So they had to figure out a way to freeze it and crop it and, and do all this stuff. Um, I mean, that looks so awesome. Yeah. So they were innovators in marketing. Um, their print ads are still beautiful today. <clears throat> and at one point, they had an ad, a big neon in Times Square. That sort of iconic shot you get of Times Square with that building that's kind of like a triangle. But at the very top of that, there was a big giant neon sign. There's a famous photo from World War II of uh, a soldier who had come back and he's kissing a woman in the middle of the street. Yeah, oh yeah, I remember you showing me that. And that photo is cropped, but the actual photo, when you uncrop it, in the background is four roses. Yeah. In the, the back of that that picture. Uh, oddly enough, I, I believe those two people didn't actually know each other. And yeah, it was just kind that of. That woman didn't want him to actually kiss her. <laughs> So yeah, they were a rectified brand. They were buying good bourbon, blending it together. Um, eventually, the current distillery that they're in, the Four Roses Distillery, uh, was built in 1910. I've actually been there. It's probably the most gorgeous, iconic distillery in all have, of Kentucky. Like, roses everywhere. No, so they were built by an architect from uh, California, and it's this sort of Spanish mission style. Okay. Um, looks very Southern California, Northern Mexico kind of style building. Um, and they're also DSP number seven, which is Distilled Spirits Permit. So they were the seventh permit issued in Kentucky. Uh, distillery was built in 1910. Uh, it's called the Old Prentice Distillery. Um, in a couple of years into Prohibition, the Jones family buys a company called Frankfurt Distilling and their distillery, which is Old Prentice. So during Prohibition, six distillers were granted licenses to make medicinal whiskey. Oh, yeah. yep. By purchasing the distillery, Four Roses could then make medicinal whiskey um, under the, the Frankfurt Distilling license and under the Four Roses brand name. So there's actually little pint bottles of Four Roses like square pints that were for medicinal purposes. Uh, and there is one actually at the distillery. I was going to say, imagine having one of those still. I mean, yeah. that's like a piece of history. It's it's pretty pretty cool to see. 
Um, also, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Why would they use medicinal whiskey? Medicinal whiskey. Uh, it was just a cop out to really just drink okay. whiskey. I didn't know if it, I mean, obviously there's not benefits from drinking whiskey, but I didn't know if there was a certain sickness that you got that they're like, they gave you. Nope, nope, nope. Um, it's kind of like ibuprofen. Yeah, take it when you yeah. Go you know, they used to use whiskey on Civil War Battlefield. Yeah. You know, it was a, like a numbing agent or a yeah. stomach agent. Uh, yeah, I mean, alcohol was kind of given credit for curing all kinds of things that it didn't, it didn't yeah, really and then cure. Yeah, they go down the road and find out that's not. And it was, yeah, part of the sort of garbage of prohibition is if you were smart, like George Remus and you owned pharmacies, then you could kind of pull stock of, of whiskey. And I think you could get a prescription for a pint of whiskey a day. <laughs> you used to also be able to get prescriptions for opium, so... Yeah, I guess it's not the worst thing. <clears throat> but during Prohibition, they developed a couple of innovations packaging-wise. Uh, one was they made a bottle that had a pour on it that made it almost impossible to refill uh, to keep people from kind of dumping out four roses and then putting inferior whiskey in and then reselling it and tarnishing their name. Um, and then eventually they came up with like a a box to put the bottle in that had a tamper-proof seal on it. Um, yeah. So innovation in packaging, innovation in marketing. They were not letting anybody mess with their product. No. That's, and, that's, that's awesome. Though. Yeah. So coming out of Prohibition, they were the number one selling bourbon uh, in the world yeah. in the 40s and the 50s. Is that just because they were selling it medicinally and then people caught on to it and were like, I like this the stuff? The brand name carried through. You know, because a lot of the brand names that existed before Prohibition were dead and then had to be revived. Yeah. They were one of the ones that was still constant throughout. Yeah. And then something really weird happens. In the early 1940s, Seagram's bought the brand and the distillery. Uh, which is funny. I wonder how many people would buy certain products if they understood who owned yeah. them when they were created. Seagram's like Seagram 7. Yep. So there was a guy named Sam Bromfman, a uh, Canadian, uh, who believed more in blended whiskeys. And blended whiskeys oh, yeah. only have to be a certain amount of actual whiskey, and the rest of it can basically be grain alcohol. Yeah. So he bought the old Prentice Distillery, which it was still known at the time, and four other distilleries in Kentucky, and then turned Four Roses from a bourbon into a blended whiskey. So it was kind of like Seagram 7. Yeah. Oh, totally totally devastates it. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and this was done at a time when all of a sudden Americans were drinking vodka, gin, wine, white rum. Yeah. Um, so whiskey companies scrambling to keep up because they were losing ground uh, made something called light whiskey. It's a whole new official category of whiskey that was created called light whiskey. Um, this interests me, so it would be like 15% alcohol? No, it was less aged, um, less body, supposedly more for mixing. <laughs> it was a debacle. Um, that is what I was, when you showed me that, I mean, gave me the paper to read, I was like, what is it? Yeah, uh, it may have actually been lower in alcohol. I don't know what the standards were. Um, I know that they could distill, because bourbon you can only distill up to 160. Uh, this, I think you could distill up to like 185, maybe even 190, like a grain alcohol, uh, which allows you to water it down and make more product. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was a disaster. Americans hated it. It's still an official classification, and I've read somewhere that there are distilleries trying to bring it back. Um, I would be very curious to try it, to be honest. Yeah, I, I would be curious to get my hands on a bottle. I've actually seen one bottle of Four Roses Light. Um, and I tried to buy it. It's actually uh, Highland Liquors over by my house has a bottle up on top of the rack, and I asked the guy, "Can I, can I buy this?" Damn, that's crazy. So, so it's just there for decoration. But yeah, Four Roses Light Whiskey. Ironically, they kept making bourbon for the Japanese market because the Japanese were still consuming American products, um, and that continues to this day. There's still a couple of bottles of Four Roses. That are only available yeah, you can't in Japan. Get them. You can't get them out here. That's <clears throat> and that's a way of... What are some of the bottles? Uh, there's one called Four Roses Black Label uh, and Four Roses Premium. 
Okay. I don't know what the difference is. Um, I've seen them, but I've never tasted them. Uh, and it's in part because they're now owned by a Japanese company. Uh, and also in part to kind of maintain that respect and loyalty yeah. for the people who cared about their brand yeah. when nobody else kind of did. Yeah, we like we helped them out. You know, they're kind of yeah. Getting back to paper, I guess. So, yeah, a couple of things eventually would kind of turn the tide. Um, one, Seagram's was kind of just dying as a business venture here in America. Um, and two, there was a gentleman named Jim Rutledge, who is probably the most important figure in the Four Roses story. Uh, he worked for Seagram's in 1966 in research and development in Louisville. Then eventually he goes to New York, uh, where he works in the corporate office for yep. like 17 years, getting pretty close to the top of the corporate rung. But for some reason, he had it in his heart that he wanted to go back and revive Four Roses. He's a saver. Yeah. Uh, he hounded them so much that they actually referred to him as Mr. Four Roses. It's a good name to have. <laughs> yeah, so he went back to Four Roses. By 2002, Four Roses bourbon, which was once the number one selling bourbon in the world, still wasn't even available in America. So he finally convinces them to let him make Four Roses yellow label to at least release in Kentucky because the people who worked there, he wanted them to at least have access to it. Yeah. Kieran buys the, the distillery, and then they... Where is that? I'm in the middle. I will... I'll hop up for a second. Yeah. In the middle of the cool This place? just proves that we are live and, and still working with customers uh, through this. So, Kieran buys the, the distillery, not only returns bourbon to an actual product, uh, but they start to remarket nationally, um, and then internationally, globally, uh, and they kind of bring Four Roses back around. Two years later, they launch a line extension, Four Roses Small Batch. Uh, we'll kind of talk about what that is. Two years after that, they launch uh, Four Roses Single Barrel. And these are sort of in response to things that were going on in the bourbon industry. Uh, when you think about what Jim Beam was doing, um, what Buffalo Trace was doing, creating small batch bourbons and single batch offerings. And these were just sort of coming back into the market. Uh, so yeah, this comes out in 02, this comes out in 04, this comes out in 06. So these are still fairly, fairly new. new. Yeah, because when yeah. you say like they've been around since the 30s and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and then for them not to release a product down until 2002, that's, yeah. that's kind of wild. They're very, very young, I feel like. Yeah. Um, and again, they were always making whiskey. They just weren't bottling bourbon yeah. under the Four Roses name. They were, during the history, making so much whiskey uh, contract making. At one point, a gentleman named Charles Beam Yes, a member of the Beam family who worked at another distillery. They worked everywhere. <laughs> Charles Beam was the master distiller at Four Roses before uh, a guy named Ova Hanley. Uh, so, Brandon right, Six. Seven, Charles Beam was the fourth master distiller in the history. He introduced Eagle Rare and Benchmark. Okay. Were both developed at Four Roses under his guidance. So they were making those bourbons, uh, they just weren't making Four Roses bourbon at Four Roses. Uh, I believe in 92 they actually changed the name to Four Roses Distillery. Um, and when Charles Beam retired, eventually they sold Benchmark and Eagle Rare over to Sazerac, and they now made it Buffalo Trace. Yeah. Um, they also were making bourbon for Bullet at one point. So all the bullet juice was coming out of there. Uh, and at one point it was coming out of Buffalo Trace as well. <laughs> so all over the place. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 02, 04, 06. And then in 2015, Jim Rutledge retired. And the new master distiller, Brett Elliott, uh, released this in 2019. This is the small batch select. Um, 
this is outrageously good. Uh, we're going to get to taste that in a second. Now, before we get to taste, I would be remiss without mentioning this. There's something very special and very unique about Four Roses, and it actually comes out of the Seagram's years. So Seagram's owned five distilleries in Kentucky. They ordered each distillery to make two different mash bills. One of which, and I want to make sure I get the configurations right. One was 75% corn, 20% rye, 5% barley. So high rye content, super low barley. The other, 60% corn, 39% rye, 6% uh, barley. So, yeah. Both high rye. Yes. Each distillery is making both of these mash bills. Each of these five distilleries had its own yeast shop. So basically, in five distilleries, you were making ten different bourbons. Yeah. Over time, they would share those yeast bourbons with each of the other four distilleries, so that all five distilleries could make all ten different bourbons. As the other four distilleries vanished, Four Roses was the only one left, they were making 10 different bourbons. When they were sold, eventually they went to Diageo, and now they're with Kieran, um, that was part of their sort of sale agreement, that they had like a proprietary right to 10 recipes. So what makes Four Roses special is they actually have 10 mash bills. And they're coded. So they're coded, you might see or read like OBS, I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, so there's OBS, which is the 60% corn, 39 rye, 6 barley. That's the OBS. Uh, and then the OBES is 75, 25. And then they have the five different yeast strains. Okay. And then each bottling is a different blend of those 10 different whiskeys. It gets technical. It's super technical. It's a big, big scientific um, distillery. That's crazy. It's pretty, pretty wild when you get down there. Um, so each yeast strain imparts a different flavor. Uh, one for fruit, one for spice, one for darker fruit, one is more floral, one is more herbal. So, Four Roses Yellow Label is a blend of all ten mash bills bottled at 80 proof. We've already tasted that. Four Roses Small Batch. This makes it so interesting. I didn't know that. Like, ten different mash bills. Ten different mash bills. Uh, and it is truly what they pride themselves on. So Four Roses small batch, and while there is no legal definition of the term small batch, this is made of 250 barrels in the batch. It is four of the mash bills spread out over 250 barrels. Um, I mean, I can list off what they are, and like all the other videos, there will be a blog post that's been written to accompany this. So all this info is in the blog post, yeah. what the different yeast strains are, the different uh, sort of mash bills that go into each of these bottles. Um, now, I know standing next to him while he's saying all this, it's hard to retain all this information at <clears throat> once, so the blog's absolutely yeah. definitely help. This was a fun one to kind of do, too. Yeah, I mean, that last part you just touched up on is, like, super, super interesting, and it makes Four Roses that much more, like, dynamic as, mm. as a distillery. Yeah, and to know that something good came out of those god-awful yeah. Seagram's years. Um, yeah, it's like the comeback kids, yeah, really. It really is, like from that high down to that low. And now, I mean, Four Roses is back atop oh, yeah. the mountain. Yeah. If you have never tried it, absolutely I mean, tried The amount of this that we sell, the amount of handles of that that we sell. Yeah, seriously. Um, it's such a good price, too. It's so, so affordable. So small batch, 
Uh, by the way, yellow label is aged a minimum of five years, so they say five to seven. Uh, this is six to eight years, so minimum of six years. And it's funny when they do those mash bills, if you kind of list the five yeast strains, the five yeast strains, um, and then each one of the mash bills, it's always this and this and this and this and this and this. So they're kind of always combining like the higher rye and the slightly lower rye with the cheese strain, kind of all across the board. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of see it mapped. Yeah. I cannot recommend this book highly enough either. It's a really quick read to go through. It looks, so yeah, that's kind of the style. That's the okay, front yeah. of it. <laughs> kind of reminds me of like Narcos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does kind of look like something out of Narcos, like a northern Mexico. Um, but there's the ten different recipes. Um, so when you see that, like O E S K, so the O is the first letter in all of the the bourbon recipes, and the O kind of stands for hours, so it just signifies that it was made at Four Roses Distillery. E or B is the mash bill. Yeah. S, depending on where you read it, either means simple whiskey or straight whiskey. And then the last letter is the strand of yeast. Wow. You kind of see the breakdown there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's crazy. So, so really, the art of Four Roses is the art of blending and science. It's just all made in one distillery. So I'm confused, like, these are all the small batch recipes, right? So which one is that one? What it say on it? This is, so the small batch is those... All together? This is actually different because it's been updated uh, a okay. little bit. This is now six different, yeah, as opposed to four. Okay. So good. Um, rich, nutty, obviously spicy, caramel, vanilla, 90 proof, no heat. That was kind of my go-to sipper for a long time. Um, when we kind of go through what our review process is, like, is it good? Yeah. Uh, is it worth the money? Absolutely. That's under 40. Yeah. I think it's actually under, might be around like 35, 40. Yeah, yeah. Um, does it look great on the bar? Without it. These are some of my favorite bottles. Yeah. Like by far. Like even this guy right here, it reminds me of like old times, kind of piratey almost. Yeah, yeah. That short stout bottle. Yeah. It so this is the single bar. Beautiful. Single barrel is aged a minimum of seven years. Um, and is obviously just one um, one recipe. Yeah. yeah so you're not blending. So it's just one recipe. It's the OBSV. Um, Fruitiness, a little vanilla, caramel, creamy. Mm -hmm. With the uh, corn. Yep. So 60% corn, this is the high rye of 30% yeah, rye. Yeah. rye. Um, and I think when we did the single barrel, when we did that single barrel tasting, we did the Blanton's, the yeah. Evan, and the, the turkey. Yeah. I want to say this one was the one that won. It certainly scored higher than Blanton's. That much I do remember. <laughs> Don't let the people hear that. <coughs> Four Roses shirt. Yeah, I think sick. From the actual distillery. I should have brought my glass, too. Yeah, I mean, the nose on that is fantastic. I like how they did this one with the higher rye, but then like the, the yeast of the bee, so it's like fruity and vanilla, so you still get some sweetness plus the rye. Yeah. It 
and they all kind of go up in price and uh, proof point. So we're 80 proof, 90 proof. Now you're at 100 proof. So you're getting more body to it. Yeah. This like diagram makes yeah. it so much cooler to yeah. think on. Because then you're like, dude. Yeah, now you're looking for like, different yeah, things. I guess you're like looking at this stuff though and you're like kind of like trying to find something. What, are you whiskey? Sure are, man. Shooting video. Shooting a live video. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything can happen here. <laughs> I guess it's not like necessarily the best to like see like these before you drink it because then like you could just have that cemented in your brain. But, but that's right. also different because like you could taste something. If we didn't have this, you yes. could taste something and say it to me and then I would taste it. But this is literally what it is. Yeah. So like, it's yeah. Should, you like, should be looking for these. And your palate's always going to be a little different anyways. Um, changes by uh, what you ate before, you know, the, yeah. you know, sort of, even where the whiskey is in the bottle, like this one's been open for a little while, whereas these other three are completely fresh. I will say I tasted that earlier. <laughs> it's been a while for me, I haven't tasted that one. <clears throat> And then lastly, we have Small Batch Select, um, which, again, shows that this book well, kind of needs to be out right? Yeah, yeah. This is... Oh, that's the one that's in uh, Yeah, those Japan. are the two that are in Japan. Yeah, so they do some other stuff, too. Um, the, the Small Batch Limited Edition. I don't remember if you tried that with me last year. I had a little sample of it. I it think tasted you, like a cherry. I think you love it. I think you gave it. Yeah. So, so good. Um, yeah, so some of those small batch limited edition barrel proof, if you can get your hands on those, they're not cheap, but man, they deliver. Yeah. All of the bottlings are cool. Like, they're all different. Mm -hmm. I mean, these two are similar, obviously, but this one, this one, those are sick looking. So, this is the newest edition permanent addition to the Four Roses family. I'm going to use the Glen Cairn glass because now we're up over 100 points in proof. Uh, so we went from 80 to 90 to 100 to 104. So this is a blend of six of the mash bills, which they list on there. But here's the thing. It's a blend of six barrels. So it's one barrel of each of those mash bills that goes into this. That's a super small batch. Every batch is only six barrels. One yeah, like of each even, of them. Even when it it's tells you the, like the thing, like there's different letters than there are now. Like there's a mint one. Or like S or F. Or you know, got it. Hmm? Yeah. But like... Yeah, uh, so that mint would be... Yeah, terrible. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to me, that slightly higher proof point changes the body on this. This... This is truly, truly special to me. Great, great nose. Big sort of spice, cherry. Now that I smell a little bit, there is like that hint of spearmint in the back there, which I do sometimes get on some of the rice that we've drank. I get a little bit of spearmint in the back. And oh, as an added bonus, this is on sale for the whole month of June for Father's Day. That makes me happy. <laughs> That's a sweet, rich, thick, heavy, spicy. It just lingers. Yeah. It's like the caramel and molasses, with peppercorns. Ugh. Yeah, it's awesome. 
That is uh, very recommended. Yeah. And again, is it worth the money? Yes. Is it good? Without a doubt. Bottle looks great on the bar. It's a winner. You just had a little section of four roses on the bar. Oh, yeah. Everyone's going to wow, those look sick together. Yeah, I mean, that lineup right there is stellar. Save up your money. Buy a bottle of each. Keep them all on the bar. Winner, winner, winner. I mean, all four of those bottles probably together is probably under 200, I'd say, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's under 20. That's under 40. That's right around 40. And that's... 60. So yeah, yes. all four under 200, without a doubt. No question, what my favorite is is this one. Yeah. Um, but bartending, this has been every bartender's sort of house favorite. Yeah. If you're doing shots of whiskey, if you're making whiskey gingers, um, it's even great in cocktails. This as a sipper. Uh, without a doubt, mm -hmm. um, especially in old fashions, Manhattans, um, that just out of a snifter in that. Leave it be. Let yeah, it just let it be. It. Don't do anything to it. It's perfect. So there we go. Get your father roses for Father's Day. Um, <laughs> we're going to wrap it up, I guess. Uh, Looking forward to hopefully having some of you guys come down. Blind taste. These two. Which, by the way, this started out here. Um, so, yeah. We're going to blind taste those two. And take a survey. See what you guys think. Looking for some good feedback from you. Uh, it'll be good to kind of hang out and, and drink with you guys tomorrow yeah. uh, as well. I think that's it. The sun is out. Things are good. Let you guys get back and enjoy the rest of your day. I'm probably going to pour a little bit more of that. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys all for being here. Uh, again, look for the blog on our website for all this other information. Um, all our sales are up there on the website, too. So check those out for uh, Father's Day weekend and, and doing some Sunday fun day shenanigans. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Cheers, all. Cheers, guys.